Good evening, Highland. Good evening. We are gathered tonight, and uh, we're gathered together for worship, thankful and always privileged that we can come together and I get to speak the Word of God to you. And I'm thankful for all that we've been able to accomplish in our worship today. And I truly hope you feel like I do today, a um, bit encouraged, uh, uh, reminded of, of what to do with the things in my life. I appreciate Brandon's lesson this morning, um, learning to lay down before our Lord Jesus our troubles and our difficulties, uh, and even ourselves in honor as we ask him to help us. This evening, what I'm doing is continuing my series on uh, how to engage our culture. I remember one time um, someone asked me why I talk about engaging culture rather than confronting it uh, or ignoring it uh, or just, you know, bad-mouthing it. Well, there's a difference between all of those. They all have different emphasis. If I'm going to combat culture then I have to think about a, and develop a warlike mentality. Now, I know we're in a battle, but our, in our battle is not with flesh and blood, but with principalities, with the way people think. And yes, there's a time when we need to make a firm, deliberate, unapologetic stand. And I'm fine with that, no problem. But not every case or every moment demands that sort of blunt force trauma. War is a blunt force trauma force. And we are often called to be harmless as doves while wise as serpents. And so, I don't like the idea of confronting culture as a default. I don't even think it's wise to ignore culture. Can a fish ignore the water that it swims in? It's, that, that's just ridiculous. It can't. Neither can we. We can't ignore the very climate we live in. We cannot ignore that we are a part of society and as part of society we are a part. We engage, we use, we leverage our culture. So ignoring it is not going to help us at all. You might as well ignore your life and that puts us in a certain kind of lunacy. Because here we are living in it while denying it, trying to just ignore it. And when we ignore something, the problem gets bigger. The problem often we lose the sense of scale. And we often forget or don't remember our place anymore. And I think for far too long we've chosen the sort of ostrich style of engaging or dealing with culture. We just slam our heads into the ground and hope it just goes by. But let's face it, we have and see in a very rapid rate a drastic change of secularization of our culture. A very uh, aggressive form of post-Christian thinking. And it would be very unwise of us to then ignore it, to not think about it, to not engage it. So ignoring it is not going to help us. It's, it is an act of false piety to ignore culture. So when I say this is a series about engaging culture, it's more about learning to get involved, maybe not in an activistic way, but learning how to balance our life with the world around us in real time. Too many times the, church, the church's response to things going on in society and culture are way too late. 
And often it's because we are not paying attention or we think we should either bring a, a, a hammer to a situation that needs a more delicate approach or we just don't deal with it at all until it comes to our doorstep and by which time the matter has become way too big when we could have had a better handle or solution earlier. I want to remind us of Paul's words. Remember, he is writing to, um, if I understand the way Ephesians is laid out, uh, Ephesians is most likely a circular letter written to multiple churches. And of course, New Testament writers always intended for other readers to come after like you and I. Christians are then to read Ephesians. And when we read Ephesians and after dealing with the unity that's supposed to exist in the church, Paul then encourages these Christians to pay attention to their environment. Look carefully. Then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time why? Because the days are evil. Because the days are, e are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In the middle of all that we, of the scripture that we, we heard in the reading, I, I want us to, to think about this section in particular, because this is where I'm going to grab some of my key thoughts. This is the key foundation for why we're talking about some of the things we will be. As Christians, we need to pay attention. Let me, let me isolate a few phrases here. He says, look carefully. Other translations like the ASV uh, would say, walk circumspectly. What in the world is that? The idea is the, of that phrase is it is trying to convey a, a, a sense of the things around you. Walk with a, a sort of understanding of the things around you. If you drive a car, you should have a sense of who's on your left and who's on your right. Who is about three miles ahead of you. Who is about a mile or two behind you. You should have a circumspect understanding of your environment. Paul's just saying as a lifestyle. The way you live. Pay attention. Look around you and make the best use of your time. That suggests there are some things that are really not worth your time. And we are flooded with all kinds of things that are absolutely time wasters. There is, even for youth, there are video games and for adults that are just called sandbox games. Do you know why? Because sandbox games don't have an ending. You just go in the sandbox and you play. I remember going to the sandbox. And you would just play and play and play until somebody threw sand in your eyes. Then the game was over, right? That's how that game ended when someone starts crying. But now in video games, we have so many games that have no end whatsoever. They started doing that in the arcade. And we knew which games in the arcade had no final ending. Spend good twenty, thirty dollars in the arcade. Make a kid broke. But we have these and, and we do this with other things in life. Politics can be a time waster and a time killer. Waste our time. Not so much knowing what's going on, but the bickering and the fighting over it. I've known people that get so obsessive about politics, that's all they can ever talk about. How's the weather? Oh, you know how these, you know, crummy blah, blah, blah are doing. I'm like, I didn't ask for that. I asked for how's the weather. What does the salinity factor in the, in the, in the clouds have anything to do with what we're doing down here? And, and even if so, I just want to know if it's sunny or raining. But there are things that waste our time. And we need to be mindful because, as Paul says, the days are evil. And, and that's really just a reminder that there are evil forces in the world. There are. It's the reason why we know 
that this world is off-center. It's the reason why we know that things are just not right. There is something spoiling where we live. I want to do another quick focus on a different aspect here. Because he says walk. That's a biblical phrase or just a way of describing your lifestyle. Walk. Not as unwise, but wise. So don't be foolish. See, it is required of Christians. It is asked of us to be thoughtful people. Not just skipping through the park and not knowing that there is a very angry dog coming my way. Too many times we are just drifting, hoping that someone else can tell us what's going wrong. And we don't take responsibility for ourselves to walk with wisdom and clarity. So this verse is massively important. And I'd like for us to just strike a few things. One would be some balance here. And I want to just say balance in the sense of, let's realize that as we engage culture, there are some things we need to be mindful of. Sometimes we say, man, things just fly by so fast I can't keep up. So many of us feel that we can't keep up with, with what's going on. There are some things I don't want to keep up on. I'm tired of downloading the newest app, social media app. I don't want to do that anymore. And that's how I know I'm getting older. That's how I know I'm done. Like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that's it. No more. I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on this. Any and None of that. I can't do it. Why? It's a time waster. I just have no time. But we need to have some balance. Some things change. Some things don't. <clears throat> Here's a common old, you know, you may have heard this before, uh, saying by Heraclitus of Ephesus. You can never step into the same river for new waters are always flowing onto you. No man ever steps in the same river twice for it's not the same river and he's not the same man. I think this, uh, uh, this proverb is pretty, pretty well tested over time. If you really understand what he's saying. You know, you put your toe in a river and that's a wonderful experience. You take it out, you're going to put it back in. It's not the same water. Because the water that touched your toe, it's gone. So now it's a different body of water. You know, and, and the same thing is true about you. You are not the same person. You're a little bit older. You know, you might be a little bit more hungry when you did it. You might be a little bit more thirsty. You might be a bit more down. You might be more excited. You may have heard good news. You may have heard bad news. You are just a different person. Things change all the time and we can't help that. We can't help that at all. That's just reality. I don't think we need scripture to prove that. Life just proves it by itself. But here's something from scripture. In the book of wisdom of, called the Ecclesiastes, uh, which is the book that probably could be just translated the preacher, the preacher preaching. Solomon in this book of wisdom evaluates things in life and he ends up just saying, look, I tried all sorts of ways of pleasure and happiness and all this stuff and it amounted to nothing. It was just vanity of striving after the wind. Kind of looked like a cloud that I can touch and then when I went for it, it just vanished. It's vapor. It's a mirage. But then he says this, what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. All things being equal, we've seen it before in some way or fashion. The earth is a, very, is a redundant place. Life is very circular. It is, we've seen it before, just different faces and different people. But you always have, for example, in high school, you always have the cool kids. And then you also have the not so cool kids. The picked on and, and the, the ones who pick on them, right? We have all these tropes. They just exist. Different names, different people. Just things are the same. We wish after we graduate high school, things would change. The workplaces can be equally just as bad. And society as well. 
Well, you might say, well, they didn't have computers and they didn't have, you know, highway, super highways. They had roads. It, a highway and a road is just the same thing. It's just speed. You know, things change, just not by much. You want computers? The body was always there. The body's a massive computer. We just call it our home of the soul. Nothing much has really changed, even though the outside of everything has. This is what we need to be understanding, though. That in the areas of change, the things that really often confront us, the things that we don't want to often deal with, things that we don't feel we don't have time for, like, we need to look at them and think about how as Christians can we live in this world, engage culture and society in a way that it keeps us faithful to God, but also that we are doing our part to reach people. Because if we cannot reach people, you cannot teach people. Why don't you repeat that with me? I'm going to say the first line and you say the second. If you cannot reach people, you cannot teach people. That's right. So this is more about us making sure we're doing our part to reach people. So what is culture? There are a lot of ways to describe it. This is perhaps a good middle of the road. You probably won't find too many exceptions to the rule here. Basically it comes up to about three things that come together to create our cultures. Culture is, here's a fancy word, integrated or just mixed. Integrated system of learned patterns of behaviors, ideas, and products characteristic of a society. This is uh, Paul uh, Hybert. Uh, he was a, a missionary to uh, many parts of the world. And over his years, he's really um, done some good writing in anthropology for missionaries. Um, use these three points for our study. Learned behaviors, uh, ideas we share, and things we make. I mean, what are learned behaviors? Guess what? Most of our behaviors and most of your behaviors, you learn them. You learn them by watching people. You learn them from your folks. You learn them by the people you were raised by. You learn them at, from school. You learn them from work. You've learned your behaviors. You weren't just born with behaviors. You learn them over time and reinforce them over time. Like in our society, how do we, in, you know, introduce ourselves? We shake our hand. We shake people's hands. Guess what? In some cultures, you don't shake their hands with your right hand. That would be considered very, very rude. Some places, in some cultures, when you meet people like in Hispanic cultures, many Hispanic cultures, not all of them, but you hug and you kiss on the sides of the cheeks. Many European cultures do that too. And we've blended that in our society here in, in the United States, but if you want to look at core cultures, they often very, have very distinctive ways of interacting and greeting each other. But you learn that. You learn that by watching people. You know what we also have learned? What to buy. Things we think we need. You know, like, how many of you have a phone on you right now? Yeah. How many of you have a TV at home? You don't have to raise your hands. You don't have to. It's okay. But my point is, who told you you had to have a TV? How many of you turn on the TV when you first walk in their house? <laughs> We have these habits, and a lot of them are not just, they don't just pop in there. Many of them are learned. Well, guess what? Our society has that. People are teaching our children new behaviors all the time. And then when they get older, they have no idea that they were in a moral battle. They had no idea they were being trained for one side of the morality debate as they got older. But they're learning behaviors. And if we're going to be effective in talking to people, we need to sit back and think a little bit. So why do you, well, how come you act that way? Where did you learn that behavior? And who told you that behavior was good? And who told you that behavior was bad? 
It's okay to ask questions. Our society doesn't like as many questions as it used to, but it's so okay to ask. Like think about what happened during COVID. During this whole year of pandemic experience and phenomenon, what did we do? We learned new behaviors. We learned to accept medical questionnaires at the door of every possible place. We learned to wear masks even where we liked it or not. We learned a lot of new behaviors. We were forced into behavior modification. But we learned them, didn't we? Whether we liked them or not. We have to look at society. They represent our values in many, many ways. We have to reflect on that. Also, it's true about what we, what we think about and, and what are the ideas going on in our society and culture right now. If you want to understand what we're talking about in society, what we're thinking about in society, you go to your newspapers, you go to the TV, you can go to the news, you can go through all the news cycles, you can go to different websites where people are talking. And, and that's really one of the fascinating things about social media is you get access to people's brains. I don't have to, you know, like the color of your eyes to talk to you on Facebook. I don't have to, any of that. If I'm talking to you, it's just your little circle picture of a monkey chasing, a, you know, whatever. And then, you know, you're talking about stuff. You're engaging their brain. In fact, when social media first launched, there, uh, I reached out to a PhD student at Berkeley. Uh, she was like this, to this um, woman by the name of Dana Boyd, and she was a leading student in social media. And one of the things she said, and it's really stuck with me, is social media was going to change how we interacted because it was not just like the telephone, but it was deeper because we were now imprinting what's going on on the inside so everyone can see it. It was like a, a door to your soul that opened and you're letting everyone in. People say things online they would never say in person. We're understanding each other a whole lot better. And I think that is one of the reasons why so many things are, are speeding along in a faster rate. But we begin to see things like modernism and postmodernism, and, and now we're really not just dealing with racism, but we're dealing with theories about racism, like critical race theory, where in essence, to me, it sounds like it just makes everything sound racist. Everything. Like there's no possible way you are not a racist under critical race theory. There's so many concerns going on that we are sharing these ideas and training our children to think in these terms. And we need to know what's going on. We need to take time to look at society and wonder what is going on and what is being said. And how can I know more to be helpful as a Christian? How do I speak against racism but not give in to that everyone is a racist? Because if God created us, there's goodness in us. We've just masked it with sin and choices. We may have corrupted our moral base, but we were made to be good. Ultimately, I believe we need to press toward that rather than look at everyone as an enemy or a possible you know, oppressor of our choices in life. The mask question is a great example. Why did we use it? What did we believe about it? Are you a good, good person if you wear it? Are you a good person if you don't wear it? Are you a bad person if you wore it? Are you a good or a bad person if you didn't wear it? Like, these were real questions. Haven't they been real questions? We've, we've had conversations like this in the church at large. We're having those questions in our culture. And even as the sort of, this seems like to be at the end ebb flow of what's going on now that the vaccines are here, there are still other questions. And they have moral value attached to them. Good or bad. You love people or you don't. What are you doing? What do you believe? What ideas do you believe about that? 
Third, things we make. I'm not going to go through the entire Industrial Revolution history here, but there are a few things we should remind ourselves. People make things to sell them. And if you stop buying because you already have one of the things that they sold you and it's working, they can no longer make things to sell because no one else is buying them and they will go out of business. So it seems pretty reasonable then you make things that are not as good or as sturdy as they could be. You know, so... We live in a world where we're constantly being told we need to make things to buy things so that we can have new things that require new maintenance protection plans and new protectors and the list goes on and on. But we live in a very tech-savvy first world culture, don't we? Many of the problems we have today, people don't worry about in other parts of the world. I remember uh, as I grew up in San Francisco, uh, as many of you know, uh, I didn't understand that houses needed air conditioning until I moved to Bakersfield. <laughs> so now, now I appreciate, and I think I even said we need to make whoever was that man who, or, or, or designers that created the first air conditioning, we need to make a national holiday for that person. Because lives have been saved. Because of that air conditioning unit. But we live in a tech savvy world. We do things all the time that are, we drive vehicles that are massively designed by engineers and scientists. We, we have clothes that make sure that we don't have allergic reactions. We, we have food that we, we're trying to unprocess the process that made processed foods that hurt us. Like we are doing so many things with the things that we make. And then there are the moral questions of how we make them, whether it's good or bad. But if, we, if we're going to be effective and look at the world correctly, and I think in the way God wants us to, we have to take a look in the global mirror and see where we live, what we deal with, and what is really going on, not what we want to be going on, we, we end up in some of the ways we talk about the world. We, we, what I hear is we, we tend to press this past, this idealized past that maybe was good for a while for some people but not everybody. But we look in the past and go and say, man, I wish we can go back there. Why? We can never go to the past. The past is as gone as that. That snap is in the past. I can't bring it back. Things keep moving. And if we're going to deal with the world, we need to deal with the world as it is. We have to deal with the world as it is. And I brought up just our TVs. Some of you remember what it was like hearing your shows on the radio and then going to color, uh, black and white TV, then going to color TV, and then having all sorts of color TVs, and then TVs with the tube, then the TVs that went flat screened, and then wide screens, and then TVs everywhere, on the wall, on the ceiling, next to your bed, on your phones, in your car, everywhere. What does that tell you about what we are asking? We want to be entertained. A lot. And entertainment is just a distraction. So how do we know the difference? How do we know what we need to be doing and when do we need to be do doing it? I want to suggest there are two ways to do it and I want to use scripture, especially the book of Acts to help us think about it and hopefully this will help you as well. Some of this you might already know and if so, it'll reinforce what you're doing and thank you for doing it already. We need to appreciate that there are people who respond to Scripture, spirituality focused on God. We need to appreciate that there are people bent toward the God of creation. And when we can talk to those 
and have a, a shared understanding or appreciation of Scripture, then we can talk to the people who are spiritually sensitive. Paul does this. We see him leaving Thessalonica and going to a small town uh, in Berea. And this is what we read. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So if you have people interested in Scripture, maybe reading the Bible for the first time, maybe after years of leaving church, they're coming back, that would be appropriate people to say, well, hey, I read the Bible too. Let's read the Bible together. You know? Let's talk Scripture. Because you know what? They're touching something that the Ecclesiastes writer says. God has made everything beautiful in its time and he, has not, and he has put eternity into man's heart yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. In other words, we know that deep down there was something beyond this world. We know the truth is out there. Our culture and society wants us to tell us, well, the only other option besides nothing is aliens. But we know there's something more than that. God has put eternity in our heart that we might grope after him. Paul would eventually make an echo of that in Acts 17. But here's our problem. I want you to listen to this quote from a New Testament scholar. Listen to this. In America, we live in a Jesus-haunted culture that is biblically illiterate. Jesus is a household name. And yet only a distinct minority of Americans have studied an English translation of the original documents that tell us about Jesus, much less read them in the original Greek. In this sort of environment, almost any wild theory about Jesus or his earliest followers can pass for knowledge with some audiences. Because so few people actually know the primary sources the Bible, the relevant texts, or the historical context with which we should be concerned. In other words, we might say it like this, where the historic church was known as a Bible-quoting, Bible-toting people of the book, we have come to a place that not even the church has escaped biblical illiteracy. We don't know the Bible the way we think we know the Bible. And we need to get back into being people of the book because it is by knowledge through that revealed word of God that we will know about Jesus. We will know how he redeems us and how he shapes us. And that living word of God will constantly transform us through the work that it was prepared to accomplish. But at this point, we're biblically illiterate and Jesus haunted and misguided and undecided. But the other side of this, the second of these two options, you have the spiritually interested, and then you have those that are more maybe skeptical or logical or philosophically focused. Paul goes to Athens in Acts 17, and he deals with these, the, these big schools of Greek philosophy, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Listen to this. And some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. That's Paul. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Not a very high estimation, right? Others said he, said he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting for we bring some for you bring some strange things to our ears we wish to know therefore what these things mean so they want to hear it and we see Paul present a very strong case in in this area and so the reason being cuz in Athens people spent their time listening and telling new things. So Paul took an opportunity in Athens. These are very different opportunities. And if you read this sermon in Acts 17, Paul doesn't go quoting scripture to people who don't care about scripture. 
Paul deals with people in the situation they are in. He hears what they're saying. He hears what they believe. And he works within their worldview. And too many times we want people to function in ours when they don't know a single thing about what we believe or what we think. We don't live in an America where people went to church, where the Bible was taught in schools, or prayer was part of culture. We don't have that culture anymore, as much as we would like to have a, a foundation on common ground. We have to learn to be able to talk to people who are skeptical. We have to learn to talk to people who at least want to hear what we have to say and what we believe. But let me tell you something. In the end, we have to realize that we've been given a mission by God and we've inherited a kingdom. We've been given a kingdom that God promises will never be destroyed. Let's not, in the midst of being concerned that we haven't won culture over to God and feel that we have failed. We haven't. We haven't. We've been given an eternal kingdom that will transcend all of our problems but we have to be involved in the engagement of our society. See, Daniel said a long time ago to King Nebuchadnezzar, when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream and he didn't know what it was and he, he, wanted, to, he wanted to really know what it was and he put a test out there and he said, I, I, I have a dream, it scared me, I want to know what it means, but I'm not going to tell you what the dream was. I want you to tell me what my dream was and I want you to tell me what it means. Nobody in the kingdom could do it. And Daniel, apparently not even having a promise from God that he would be able to do it, he said, I'll do it. And then wouldn't you know it, God gave it to him. And in this discussion, Daniel tells the king that you had a dream of a great image. And that image represented four unique kingdoms. You are the head of gold. You are the first kingdom. Another kingdom will come and surpass you. And then another kingdom will come and surpass that one. And as the body and the materials of the body begin to, you know, transition to different kingdoms and they go lower down the body to the legs and the feet, he says there will be a kingdom that is like the legs and the feet. And it will be that kingdom, this fourth kingdom, during this time, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and, break them, and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. This fourth kingdom is the Romans. In the Roman era, God was going to do something and establish his kingdom. Do you know when Jesus lived and died? In the Roman Empire, era of the Roman Empire. You know when the church began? In the Roman Empire. Mark chapter 9 verse 1 talks about Jesus saying and affirming he would establish his kingdom. Mark 9 1, Jesus said, There are many living today that shall not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God come with power. And although... Not from the same hand, but same spirit. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus promised his disciples that they needed to stay in Jerusalem to wait for the Holy Spirit and they would be given power. And this power would allow them to speak in powerful ways and not just powerful ways, but speaking languages they had no training in. And through that, the preaching of the gospel emerges and is able to change the world immediately because the people that heard the apostles were from all over the Greco-Roman world who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover and for the other festivals that came with it. Well, here's something that's interesting about this promise. These are not the only words. Daniel says right after this, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, that's God, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain. And its interpretation, sure. 
May I suggest to you that as we engage society, engage culture, we don't have to fear whether the kingdom or the church or the gospel is going to be successful. It's going to be eternal. It is eternal. That is a promise from God affirmed to be sure and true and certain. But what needs to be also certain and sure and dependable is God's people willing to step up to engage culture rather than hide from it, ignore it, or come off as brutal, hammer-waving people who, would rather, who see a nail in every person. And you know when you have a hammer and you have a nail, you know what happens. That's not the picture of Christ. There are times when we need to confront what is going on. There are times when the niceties and the gentleness and the, the, that part of a conversation needs to transition towards stronger words. But we wrestle with words, not with people. We wrestle with ideas, not with physical people. And we enter into a spiritual warfare because the days are evil and there are spiritual entities that wish to continue a persecution and onslaught onto God's people. But God's people will endure to the end. I hope you understand what I'm asking of us tonight. And if I haven't been very clear, let me just say it this way. We have been called to a moment of destiny. We are a part of God's eternal plan. And in that, we need to take on the reality of this is real. Christianity is supposed to change our worldview. Christianity is supposed to change why we do what we do and why we love the people we do. And it's not for us to fight for lines on the, on the map. It's us for us to go beyond borders, beyond boundaries, because the kingdom is eternal and we're all members of it. So let's do our part. I hope you'll think about this and I hope it'll be impressed upon you as to what your, your responsibilities are. And if you need prayers of encouragement for that, I really want to encourage you to let us pray for you. Maybe not right now. Maybe you don't want to do it in front of all of us. If you want prayers, you can just call any of your brothers and sisters. You want to call me. You want to call the preachers. Or you want to call the elders or the deacons. Don't let being nervous of coming forward hinder you from doing the right thing in your life. But if you want to do that right now, you have all of us supporting you. So... If you're subject to the invitation, please let us know while together we stand and sing. Hey, thank you so much for watching our videos and content. If you want more videos, more content, and want to know more about us, visit our website or subscribe to us on YouTube and like us on Facebook. We'll see you next time.